Joining a professional body has never been more important. Join thousands of other professionals just like you who are getting ahead with CIHT membership. Go to the CIHT website and discover exclusive resources and why the leaders and future leaders of the sector are members with CIHT. Welcome to CIHT Podcasts. In December last year, CIHT published Fixing a Failing Planning and Transport System, a piece of collaborative research between the CIHT Royal Town Planning Institute and the Transport Planning Society, which detailed the five key actions from over 3,500 written responses planning and transport practitioners as to how best fix the land use and transport planning system. There was much mention of the inadequate national planning policy framework in England and with the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities currently seeking responses to their consultation on proposed changes to this framework, we have an opportunity for change. To discuss this further, I am today joined by Neil Johns, current CHT President, who will unpack this important issue. Welcome to CIHT's Transport Talks. I'm your host, Cal Fairbairn. Welcome, Neil. To start and to set this all in context, can you describe your own career journey and background? Yeah, hi, Kyle. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, doing this with you today. You've also picked a topic that feels like um, has never not been part of uh, the discussions in the industry throughout my career, which, um, uh, yes, is just over 40 years. Uh, some things don't change, although a lot has uh, in that in that period. But uh, the fundamentals of this, let, let, let me say, first of all, in relation to this topic, let's say I had um, the early part of my career in a local authority. It was one of the larger regional councils in, in Scotland, and we were therefore the strategic planning authority and the, the, the Roads and Transport Authority. And while I was there, I was clearly on the, the, the authority side of life. And uh, I, I was fortunate. Um, I, I did a classic uh, graduate training scheme where I was trained and exposed to all aspects of, a you might say, the project life cycle or um, the roads asset. Uh, but part of that involved uh, seeing how local planning occurred. It, it's something that we weren't uh, taught in our university course, but you learn how low structure, first of all, structure plans were, were arranged, high level, uh, very strategic. And then the, along with the local uh, councils that we had then, district councils as they were, they had local plans. But uh, I was part of a team that was involved in providing transportation input to local plans, which seemed all very sensible. We were looking ahead, we were planning for growth it was all about economic uh, aspects and proper services and facilities for the public. So while we were planning on that and working with the local planners at the same time, and I think this was very interesting, we were part of the development control process. So by by planning law, the planning authority, when they got all the planning applications, were obliged to consult with the roads and highways authorities. They didn't have to have a response from them. It was really up to the attitude of the of the the road staff. But nearly always, um, I worked in a culture where we we commented on nearly everything because nearly most applications would have a, a, a an impact on on the road system. So what we were doing there is we were seeing what the the futuristic planning was, but also the day to day nitty gritty of what was happening in the real economy. Because planning is about changing land use so that we can create new opportunities for people to live for people to work, go to school and take leisure, all, all these features of, of, of life. And uh, you, you learn about the theory, but then the day to day practice comes in and you, you deal with developers, you know, face to face. So I've got that segment early in my career. But after about a decade of that, I moved into consultancy. And a lot of the consultancy work I did with a company then called Halker Fox, we, we specialised in traffic and planning and uh, I found myself working for some of the developers that used to uh, come to the council seeking planning permission for their developments. And uh, that, that was fascinating to see what their motivating uh, drivers were in, in, in bringing forward development. So from that point of view, over the years, I've actually seen I've seen the, the uh, development planning world from both sides. I'll, I'll try and bring that some points from from that career into the podcast. Brian, thank you, Neil. Varied career there. And I think just touching on that 
to start it'd be good to get your views on and also just the general perspective on what what the current state of play is in the sector with regards to planning and transport policy and it, and it seems just from what you've said there it's definitely changed from when you started your career yeah it definitely has uh, Kyle what what um, I always got the feeling early in my career that you know planning was um it is and rightly very important and, and it's a multi-factor art I would call it that is that the planning officer was considering a multiplicity of factors depending on the development you know there, there could be jobs to consider there might be hazardous emissions that result from the development there might be bad neighbor problems there's a whole host of things architecture practicalities that that, that would bear and I always I began to realize that it was the planning officer's job to balance up the factors and present a, a report to the elected members the other thing I learned very early on is that well, there's a lot of uh, science that we would use in the traffic side of life and, and other professionals to, say, comment on the quality of a development. At the end of the day, I soon learned that planning was a political process. It was elected members in a local council who made these decisions. And uh, if those decisions didn't turn out the way the developer wanted, you, you can end up with appeals. And it goes to public inquiries and to higher levels. And there's another whole interesting raft of professional skills that were called on when that when that happened. But um, what I felt at the time was, uh, I think as transport professionals, we always felt that we had to fight and uh, try and make our case as strongly as possible. When we felt passionate that there was a real issue, it could be on road safety. It may be that the, what was being proposed was, was downright hazardous. We, we felt we would a an obligation, professional obligation, to, to point these things out. Um, so in those days we were, you know, I, I felt, you know, trying to work hard to, to have our voice heard. I think over the period um, that has improved uh, definitely. But the, the one thing that hasn't changed is the, the, the plea that as transport professionals that we've, we've been trying to get across, I think, to, to the planners that the, the, the die is cast sometimes at the local plan level when sites are allocated and if if those sites are are not in the right place from a a transport perspective then you're actually baking in problems which are always going to be hard to solve so we've always argued i think as a profession for the earliest possible consideration of transportation effects when doing land use planning and, and in fact they're best done together so what we have seen possibly halfway through my my long career, we began to see uh, strategic land use models that would look at the impact of putting different types of development in, in different places. The thing to remember is that um, every every land use usually generates a, a movement. You know, it's a trip end, transports the dir- a drive demand, as we know. Um, so it does make sense that we look at how many trips are generated by a, 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 a square kilometre of a certain type of land use and in all that period we saw the evolution of trip rate models the the tricks database became almost de rigueur as a, as a reference point for information on trip generation uh, and distribution so those are uh, some of the uh, the changes i've seen the current state of play i think is that in spite of all this i would say increased uh, complexity and uh, ability for our profession to model the impacts and also look at wider impacts that have resulted, including um, emissions, air quality, noise, etc. While all these things have come to the table, we still seem to end up with with problems resulting when developments actually get built out and we, we, we see these effects. I think what we are seeing in the most recent period is that clearly it's the harmful effect of greenhouse gas emissions on the ozone layer has got much more prime importance at the moment. And I think that's a new factor in the urgency that we need to uh, attach to trying to iron out some of these perennial problems. And just on the political element that you, that you mentioned, the transport's devolved in, in the UK. Um, and then and then we, we obviously see that differing policy in, in, in the devolved nations towards transport and, and the way it's integrated with planning policy. Scotland in particular, CIHT responded to the MPF4 consultation, which now is published. 
Yeah, so so in Scotland we can see that integrated framework between sort of planning and transport policy, which is good. And then, like you say, the the reasons behind that are obviously with climate at, at the forefront. In England, we can see th- there's this current consultation that CIHT is responding to on the national planning policy framework that is maybe a hint that things are coming or or, or mm. changes afoot. I suppose the question is why why that that is happening. We've we've briefly touched on it. Um, but it'd be good to find out, you know, why is it important that we see these two things integrated? Scotland has started to do it, and it is doing it. You know, what, why? What's the reason behind integrating? I think, um, I think, as I said at the start, even even all those forty years ago, it, it's recognised that there is an interrelationship. But as as we began to witness some problems, I mean, I think in post-war Britain, we, you know, everyone was delighted to see economic development, creating jobs creating jobs for people in the car factories even and you know building lots of roads and, and railways and things in, in, in that sort of uh, spirit of um, making things better in the world at large I think there was less uh, attention given to environmental issues of the day but as we become to see what some of those problems were and as we saw hot spots in the network because one of the things is that developers were actually they're quite 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 astute and and, and it does make sense to exploit existing infrastructure infrastructure so if you can see capacity near a major intersection if you're a developer you can actually um how do i say utilize some of that capacity to put your development close to that and get the benefit of using it but yeah what, what we began to see is that there's an intensification of, of congestion delays and, and other undesirable effects in society and and this began to be seen as a planning problem, which was quite right. But I think we could move forward a fair bit there, Kyle, and say that intellectually, I think the professions saw that and they had to try and push forward in the political world. So you say that things moving on a bit, uh, they're moving on. They, they have. And I think in general, you start with a policy framework for everything. And in Scotland, the major move, I think, was in um, 2016, we saw the first integrated transport policy national transport policy in Scotland, which um, was was certainly welcomed by CIHT. And uh, we began to see land use having, it was quoted more in how the the, the transport policies uh, were devised. We also saw in the national planning framework in Scotland that, you know, transport was being reflected a bit more. Fast forward to, you know, recent years, we've had a second national transport strategy in Scotland that's integrated. That's got, it has even more got climate and health and well-being issues at its centre. But we've also got a new national planning framework for MPF4 in Scotland, which is is really its headline um, issues are it's about creating a sustainable country that is a uh, livable and it has productive places. And uh, it also acknowledges um, the need for a net zero outcome for for the nation at large. So we see that happening there. I could comment a bit more on saying that's the policy framework, the delivery might be something else. These things are quite slow burners. But when you change the national policy, it takes some years to filter through. So in England just now, as as you know, I think uh, as CIHT, we're in the process of responding to the latest NPPF. Um, But let, let me say straight up there, what I'm delighted to hear Kyle is that um, the, the policy team that you're you're in are you know collaborating with both RTPI and the Transport Planning Society. I think is a very very good message to show how we as professionals are jointly concerned. I.e., there is an appreciation that it's the it's the integrated it's the outputs of our integrated efforts that are important here in in getting to net zero. And um, I think as I read it, our our draft response is suggesting that uh, we think the changes that are currently being proposed by the the government are very weak and not very strong and unlikely to lead to meaningful change in in the short term. That's quite worrying because uh, the the, the time it takes for a, a national planning policy change to filter down to become law and then for the local authorities is to deal with that. And let's remember, these are local authorities that are strapped of resources just now. There's a shortage of skills to respond to, you know, transforming local plans uh, quickly. So you could easily see seven to 10 years before the material uh, impacts that we want to see actually materialise on the ground. So there is a concern there that um, even well-intentioned uh, improved integration between transport and land use planning is uh, well it's accepted it'll be very hard to deliver 
quickly. Yes, it's a very good point, Neil, about because obviously CIST and, and other institutions collaboratively have, have been, well, championed that these, these sort of integration of planning and transport for a long time and then, you know, ask for, ask for these changes to be done immediately really uh, to policy but like you say that timeline of getting these changes into policy and then seeing it being delivered on the ground you know it's it's quite it's quite a while away with this current consultation on the national planning policy framework in england Uh, at least at least this one at the minute we're not quite seeing those changes being suggested they're a little bit further down the line on that timeline like we say, with all these reasons why climate at the forefront, but all the other things around improved health outcomes, mm. reducing transport inequality, make getting more people on public transport, productive economy, that's is is delaying that to an extent as well. If we're not seeing these changes being implemented faster, because like we say, the delivery at the end is the most important part, and it's a long way off. It seems like you're you're absolutely right, um, and Kyle, it is a bit um, depressing. I have to say that. You know, when, when you get to my stage, being in the twilight of my career, I, I thought things might have moved a bit faster. But I'm afraid the the, the um, inertia or the trickle that these processes go through, that if you're not bold uh, at a point like this in, in, in our um, industry's history, then uh, it, it'll be beyond 10 years before the meaningful actions take place. And the, the climate action the plan that we have, we need to remember, this is a legal, it's a, the planning uh, legisl- it's legislation. The other bit of legislation that we have and all need to be aware of just now is to the pathway to net zero by 2050 is a legal requirement. Sometimes I just wonder if all the different agencies of government have got that message. It doesn't seem to be chiselled on their foreheads. Our profession, we're largely responsible to a large extent for surface transport. Now, we can't control everyone's choices, but we have a big role to play in how society tries to to, to do that. One of the things I noticed is that uh, in these draft uh, changes to NPPF is that there's a lot of reference to, to encouraging uh, public transport and things like this. I can remember writing transport policy documents in the 1980s in Lothian region when we began to write encouraging public transport. It was a sort of nice thing we stuck on at the end of the roads progress report. And I uh, can't believe that um, I've just about got through my professional life and that hasn't you know, changed uh, significantly. I think there's lots of examples that we can see and draw on. And, well, maybe that's one of the benefits of devolution is that... Um, you know, the regional and nation areas can 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 do some things on their own and and learn things and share those experiences, which do, does make me think a very a lot about what we do in CIHT. One of the things I love about our institution is the way that we draw on experiences from around, you know, the whole country and indeed the world, and we bring those and exchange them, try and enhance the professional standing. But at the same time. In CIHT, we do want to be influencers of good practice and uh, good policy. So that's why I, I'm delighted that we're trying to make the strongest possible noises in these consultation responses. But at the same time, hopefully through this podcast and the publication of um, fixing the, the broken planning system and other webinars and initiatives we have, that we can share this this knowledge and make it a bigger topic of discussion and action you know for our for our members yeah and obviously to, to pick the mood up a bit because it's not all doing and gloom certainly in the old because mm. <laughs> the, i mean we can we can we can definitely be constructive about it and it, and it's certainly there is good examples about there of, of good good practice and, and like we say there is signs of things to come like we, we talked about policy and devolved nations and things like that so it is edging that way and it's certainly edging that way with the UK government too maybe a bit slowly but mm-hmm. there's certainly good examples out there so it'd be good to if, if there's any that you know of or that you came across professionally yeah there are some bright spots um there's also some not so bright spots as I travel around them um, I hate to dwell on this um, passage of time in my own career but uh, some of the local plans where I was drawing uh uh, lines for new div- uh, distributor roads and major developments in parts of the area that I live in. Um, I've returned to some of these places and, and uh, I see some of them are, are working well. Um, a number of these were uh, the road corridor that was um, recommended be protected. Um, these are wide enough to allow cycle 
uh, facilities and, and walking facilities that are quite generous in proportions. And in, in some places, um, carriageways that are wide enough for, for buses to facilitate. And, and it pleases me. It brings joy to my heart when I see these things happening especially when there are buses present. What doesn't uh, bring so much joy to my heart is some of those developments I, I've been into recently and I see bus shelters and bus stop signs and uh, Kessel curbs, but there are no buses. And that's because of the, the way that we arrange uh, bus services in this country and in the current budget climate. There's very little chance that some of these large urban and peri-urban development sites for housing will will ever see buses so we are effectively building car based developments but there is one there is one development outside edinburgh that uh, i know quite well and it's in its early stages it was the result of a structure plan competition for three and a half thousand houses and uh, because of the way it was uh, it came about through a competition and the master planning was was a requirement there are some excellent active travel facilities and the disposition of land uses. And this is one example. It's, it's out at Winchborough in West Lothian. As part of that development, there are new schools that are being built in. And you can see how the juxtaposition of schools and housing and leisure facilities and play facilities for children, I can see that being um, very much a non-car based um, element of life in that community. However, I can still see uh, at this stage that um, in that community that cars are very much the popular mode. And I also think we haven't even yet got right our assessment of how many cars per household these developments will have, because in a brand new development that I am familiar with, uh, if you travel into that early in the morning, as I've done a couple of times, you basically see the residential car population. And not only are the driveways full of cars, but the, the visitor parking is, is largely utilised, as is the road space. So we're starting off with substandard parked up roads in the opening of construction. That's not that's not helpful to the cause. Otherwise, it's a good site. But I might just mention in, on this uh, particular site, the one thing that I see as a known goal, and it illustrates, well, you can have very strong national and local policies based on the sustainable travel hierarchy this major development uh, will require access to the local motorway and also a mainline railway station. The sustainable hierarchy says we should be looking at active travel first, then public transport, bus and rail. The railway station, there is no sign of this being constructed at all at present, but they're about to open the motorway junction. And to me, that's a bit of an own goal in trying to inculcate good behaviour by the residents as they move into this growing development. So, um, yeah, I realise I've given you something that I think is good, bad. So delivery, delivery is important. Um, every bit is important, if not more so than policy. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and on that delivery point, you know, we mentioned that a few times and that is really, really important because we can have all, all the policy and legislation that we like, but if we're not following that through it on the ground, then it's, you know, it's never going to happen. And a big, obviously a big part that plays into that is, you know, the skills, capacity and capabilities of our professionals. And it, it's something that has been highlighted in a lot of CHT's work and is is one of CHT's strategic priorities is remote learning. And it's, we do a lot with our members in, in doing so. But yeah, just it'd be good to touch on just what we're doing as an institution and how we're filling that gap and making sure that our professionals are, you know, adequately prepared to deliver you know the, the infrastructures of the future. Yeah, no, there's, that, that, that's a good a good point, um, Kyle. The, I mean, I think the the traditional way, a lot of work that um, our members did, where they work for the developers, and it's actually it's very exciting work and very. Um, I, I've done a lot of it, and I've been to public inquiry to argue the case for developers. And I've been grilled by opponents. And uh, there's nothing that tests your professionalism more than that public examination of your of your technical skills. So I'd always recommend that, you know, people don't shy from getting involved in that because it's it's an excellent thing to do. Um, a lot of the the work, though, that traditionally we've done is, is very technical in nature. And it's usually about we are working for clients and we're helping them make modifications to the existing transport network, usually the road network, uh, to show how the, the development can, can uh, be built out so that it doesn't cause problems on the road network and uh, in, in this day and in future days. So 
there's a lot of technical arguments and those skills have been honed and new tools have emerged over the years like micro simulation and so on. What's also come into play though is that um, as, as we look at integrated transport we, we need to understand how pedestrians and cyclists and, and vulnerable road users and uh, people who use public transport can actually benefit from the way the development is is, is offered. Also some in, in, the, in the old days I keep referring to the developers actually in the 1980s were quite used to putting their hand in their pocket and being reasonably generous with enhanced infrastructure um, sometimes which might be a little bit beyond the the basic necessities but uh, that was well understood then changing economic circumstances has changed that somewhat so it's a it's not so easy to get that but what we what we need to do is that the skills that we had then, uh, Kyle, have broadened into a need to understand sustainable transport modes, um, as well as just traffic engineering. Um, so in that regard, I mean, CIHT Learn is um, is becoming a very well visited place for information on basically sustainable travel planning. There's also, uh, it, it should be said to a lot of our members that um, with the recent uh, budget commitments both in England, Wales and Scotland to active travel. There's almost a, a new branch of the industry uh, coming into play and uh, from what I've been hearing as I've travelled around the country as president that uh, you know that the skills are not in great abundance there. So I think there's a great opportunity for people to uh, take note of that, look at our modules, get trained up in that and uh, play a big part in moving um, you know our country into uh, more active travel and reduced emissions. The, the other thing about the skills is the actual exchange of knowledge about what we discover, just like we're doing today. I, I think the piece of work in, where you and the col our colleagues um, worked with RTPI and TPS was fantastic. I think the number of people that you got to respond to the survey and uh, you had over 3,000 written responses, I know. To me, that's powerful that it came from the different aspects of the development process you know the planners and the transport planners I, I think that's very powerful and yes i just hope government take heed of the five uh, key points we made there which in, in summary were that the uk government must provide a robust and integrated policy framework and uh, if, if i may if there's time just go through the others skills and experience we've we we're discussing just now about how important they are it's for us as institutions to, to make our um, profession uh, attractive and also to support the members with qualifications and CPD, technical skills. The third of those five points that our joint analysis of professional analysis came up with was the importance of uh, location planning, especially when you're looking at major attractors, those transport oriented developments like schools and hospitals universities that uh, you know their locations can be very very critical to the the outturn in movements uh, within a community um, and then if I move to the fourth point is that the planning authorities should really be refusing developments that don't uh, prioritize sustainable transport and um, I'm afraid I see lots of examples of that Kyle I think at the moment I'm seeing more of the the negatives I see sites that are often not in the local plan but go to they test the the, the system by uh, speculative development going to appeal and we get another car based development stuck on the edge of a community which just generates more car traffic and that piece of work about fixing things is that we we want to appeal to government to fund uh, more effectively the delivery of the facilities that we need here and it may be that uh, developers sometimes do have practical limits on the viability, you know, the financial viability of their investment in the development. Um, so maybe we do need to um, appeal to government to get more cash into the system to allow critical connections to strategic cycle networks, for example, to be in place um, to fix some of those problems. But I also think we need government funding to ensure that the local authorities have got enough uh, resources to employ the right number and quality of planning staff and transport planning staff to do the vetting and the policy setting in the councils. So I've I've um I've kind of covered what was in that last piece of work, but I think that's symbolic of what CIHT has done in the past and 
we'll continue to do in the future on behalf of the members. Absolutely, Neil. And and just to finish, I, I'd, I'd just like to remind everyone, you know, to find out more about CIST's position on on the integration of planning and transport and and other things is is to look out for a consultation response which will be submitted on the 2nd of March to this MPPF consultation and also if you'd like to look at the white paper to to, to check it out on the CIST's website as well and also just to tie into the final skills point is CIST not long ago released this transport de- decarbonisation pathway which is really really important resource and, and takes a lot of the boxes of, of what we've been discussing today so I'd, I'd highly recommend that everyone goes and looks at that too. So Neil thanks very much for your time today it's been a brilliant discussion. You're welcome Kyle thanks to you and your team for all the good work that you're doing and uh, integrating with the other professional institutions and making sure that we maximise our influence on government. Thank you. Joining a professional body has never been more important. Join thousands of other professionals just like you who are getting ahead with CIHT membership. Go to the CIHT website and discover exclusive resources and why the leaders and future leaders of the sector are members with CIHT.